Steve Snyder, you were blind at seven. Legally blind? I was blind from the age of zero. <clears throat> and at the age of seven is when the doctors gave up on me. I was born with cataracts, glaucoma, nystagmus, and cross-sidedness. The cataracts were operated five by five surgeries, and the results of the surgeries were that a major scar tissue was left in my lens area. Unfortunately, in that time, there were a lot of surgeries like this. And I was left with such small bits and pieces of lenses yeah. that only three quarters of one percent in this eye of lens area is left, and only five percent of the lens area in this eye is left. And the doctor simply thought that physically there's no way for me to see. So you must have wore glasses as thick as everything. I uh, wore dark glasses. Dark glasses? Yeah. All along? So people will not see how my eyes are moving. All along? Well, I wore them until I was close to 17. And at that point, I was taught eye exercises. What my instructor, and it's written in my book, Self-Healing, My Life and Vision, taught me was um, how I'm not nurturing my eyes. You're not nurturing your eyes. Right. He asked me, do you nurture your eyes? And I said, what do you mean? I learned to ignore them. I learned to read Braille. Yeah. And if I ever looked close to where the Braille is, my teacher would say, lift your head up. You don't see it anyway. Forget it. So uh, my eyes were simply left away. And I started to learn from my instructor that to, to begin with, I need to nurture my eyes. Okay. You nurtured your, your eyes? Let us say to such a degree that today you can see me now? Yeah. And yeah. you don't need glasses? No. You yeah. drive a car? Yeah. And your license does not say this man is three quarters blind or anything like that? Well, well if, it, if it would say it about me, it should say it about everybody else that drives. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but no, it doesn't say it. It doesn't and say that. The point is yeah? that first of all, I learned that the way for me to nurture my eyes was through relaxing them. And the question was, why do you need to relax if you don't see? And one of the things that I really learned is that you work very hard at not seeing, just like you work very hard at not moving. We all think that if you don't see, you don't do anything. Yes. But actually, you are working very hard at the stagnation of the eyes. So, but there was no medical intervention. They didn't operate, they didn't do this, they didn't do that. Yeah, they operated and then I could see. That you could see, but for you to see, they did not operate. Right, no, no, no way. So therefore, your eyes became better, can I say, only through the process of you nurturing them. Right, and I did it through eye exercise. Okay. Dr. Solomon, does that make any sense medically? That here is a man who is blind since birth, <coughs> And all of a sudden, 10 years, 17 years after his birth, by doing exercise, concentrating upon his eyes and all the rest of it, he sees. Well, my, my own field of competence has to do with the immune system, and that doesn't sound like it does to do with that. But indeed, I've learned that uh, many things uh, seem uh, very, very strange uh, that do happen. Uh, the problem then becomes to understand how they happen. So I don't know how that happened. But in your experience, the process is that the determination of his mind to affect this organ, the eye, was such as that he did. Or can we conclude that? That's not the only thing, though. Let's yeah. be fair about it. Yeah. What I want to say is that two things our mind does. One thing, it can help us, and one thing, it can stagnate us. Right. Now, the mind of society and of the doctors basically told me, you have hardly any lens left, don't even bother thinking about it. That is what happens to most of the people who are legally blind today. They see so little that nobody makes anything out of their potential to see any further. What I did with the exercises, which are natural exercises, first relaxing the eyes, then adapting them to the sunlight, to strong light, then learning that I'm looking at the whole world as a blind person means I'm not looking at areas, I'm not looking at details. I started to retrain my brain to start and look at smaller areas, and I've given my lenses uh, more flexibility, the bits and pieces I've left. I've given my brain 
retraining. I've given my eyes more strength, and I built vision with uh, with a poor beginning, with a uh, anatomical deficiency. And I think that's what how we should look at the rest of the body. Many people completely write off people who are partially paralyzed and make them even more paralyzed than they are by not encouraging them to work what they have to the utmost limit. That is one thing of the mind, that we really don't allow ourselves to develop as much as we can. So that therefore, what you did with your eyes, you could have done with other ailments that might affect your body. Absolutely. With if the nervous, I came, hmm? with the nervous system, with the muscular if, system. If, if I came system. to you and said that I have cancer of the pancreas, what can you do? Do you advise me not to go to a traditional practitioner, or do you just advise me to exercise my pancreas? I don't know how you got your question for my answer. It's uh, kind of twisted. No, but I want but to go further than that. Well, you're going backwards, well, but the point you, is... You look what he said first. He, he exerted some sense of control, and he saw his... and he saw the handicap he had as a challenge. Uh, a, a psychologist named Susan, uh, Suzanne Kobasa has uh, pointed out that hardy people, people who have good health, have a commitment to life, they have a sense of control over what happens to them, and that they can influence what happens, and they see stresses more as challenges, as adversity as a challenge, rather than something about which one is uh, helpless. This is exactly what happened in Meyer's case, that he found a mechanism to get around and overcome a handicap. It didn't miraculously disappear. He worked on it. And the, can I apply that theory to other ailments of the body? Yes, to anything which tends to degenerate and decay in the body and to anything which is a result of neglect of the body. And I think that 99.9% .9 of problems have to do with it. Is this why you say in your book that no ailment is incurable? That is a hope for the future that we're going to build up such, uh, that we're going to uh, utilize our resources to such an extent that eventually we will have no illness. But we're living in a world where we're only using 50 out of the 600 muscles we possess if we function normally. Where we breathe only 300 milliliters of air per breath when actually we can breathe up to 6,000. And we need to learn what patterns stop us from functioning fully and what patterns can help us to function fully. Whether we are almost blind, whether we are paralyzed, whether we function normally but not healthy. You're a doctor? Yes. Where do you practice? At St. Paul's Hospital. Does this attitudinal healing, this kind of capacity that he talks about, what do doctors at your hospital think about that? I suspect many physicians at a well-known teaching hospital are not truly aware of the potential for attitudinal healing. In my own practice as an oncologist, there's a great deal of attitudinal healing that goes on with people who have various kinds of treatment. And the approach that I try and take in clinical practice day to day reflects a belief on my part that the individual has the right to exercise his and her maximum potential at getting better. And, and you can do that, and she can do that? They can do that. They can work at it. They can make it happen for them under the right circumstances. I think that part of the problem people tend to get into is the concept of saying, here's a terminal patient with metastatic cancer of the pancreas. Doctors have failed them, treatment is not working. Right. Let's go into attitudinal healing. And I think that's an inappropriate approach. I think that patients who have what many physicians would call terminal illness actually have an illness that they can work through with attitudinal healing. I think our pur purpose is, as physicians is to try and help them by using the methods that we know best. But I don't think we're capable or trained properly to deal with methods that other people are better at utilizing. Thank you. Thank you. And I need to take a break now, and we shall return right after this. So please stay with us.